Thank you for joining the Rieti BBL seminar today. Uh, my name is Shujiro Urata. I'm a chairman of Rieti. I will be serving as a moderator for this seminar. Today, we are truly honored to welcome Professor Richard Baldwin, Professor of International Economics at IMD Business School in Lausanne. Uh, Professor Baldwin uh, is also the founder and editor-in-chief of the policy portal uh, VoxEU.org. Uh, Professor Baldwin has published widely on topics related to uh, trade, regionalism, and globalization, and others. He regularly advises governments and international organizations on globalization and trade policy issues. Before moving to Switzerland in 1991, he was a senior staff economist for the President's uh, Council of Economic Advisors in the Bush White uh, House. Uh, following trade matters such as Uruguay round and NAFTA negotiations, as well as numerous <coughs> US Japan trade conflicts. Uh, he did his PhD in economics at MIT with Paul Krugerman and has published a half dozen uh, or more articles with him. Before that, he earned uh, MS, Master of Science, at LSC and BA at University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, his most recent book uh, is the globalization, <coughs> uh, Globotics Upheaval, Globalization, Robotics, and the Future of Work, which has been translated into Japanese. Uh, Professor Baldwin will give a talk titled uh, Global Supply Chain Disruptions, Japan and the World. Professor Baldwin, please. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks uh, to Rieti and Yurata-san for inviting me and allowing me to share my ideas with this very important audience. Um, and I want to apologize that I'm not an expert on Japan. So this isn't a paper or presentation uh, directly uh, aimed at informing policy in Japan. It was, uh, as we'll see in a second, done for the US to start with. But I have come up with a few charts uh, for Japan to, to sort of uh, show that it, it's relevant at least a, a little bit. OK. So with that, I want to uh, just point out that the basis of this uh, pay, this uh, presentation is a Brookings paper on economic activity that will be published uh, this year. It was from the conference of September called Hidden Exposures, Measuring U.S. Supply Chain Reliance. And it's with Rebecca Friedman, who's an economist at the Bank of England, and Angelos Theokopoulos at Aston Business School. <clears throat> Today's learning journey. So I work for a business school now, so we have to have a learning journey. It's not an agenda anymore. Uh, so we do global framing of supply chain disruptions and uh, fun facts for Japan. And then measurement issues and introducing our new indicators. That's essentially what this is all about. We in introduced a number of indicators of supply chain dependence. Uh, and then we'll go to say, is policy needed? Now, the goal of the whole thing is to provide some new insights and global supply chain disruptions, which I think is, uh, is needed. Let me start. And I have to point out that I've fallen in love with ChatGPT's ability to generate graphics. So I took that, global framing of supply chain disruption, typed it into Chatty, and 15 seconds later, it came out with that thing. And I've been wasting way too much time playing around with these things. So as you'll notice, I don't know if you noticed here, but uh, on this one, Japan's in the middle of the earth. So I put in the title. And it didn't, it was, I forget who was in the middle. And I said, put Japan in the middle. Regenerated the whole thing, and Japan was in the middle. So uh, it's, it's, it's fun. And I hope you will appreciate them. I've probably put in way too many. <laughs> there we go. OK. <clears throat> now, this is a, the basic question here. Before, and I'm talking about just a few years ago, global supply chains were viewed as a source of productivity and growth. They were a good thing, both in developed countries and developing countries. Now, they are viewed as a source of vulnerability. For instance, the last G7 communique mentioned supply chain resilience as an important issue. So we now have the heads of states 
Biden, Macron, all of them talking about supply chain disruptions and the vulnerability they, uh, they in imply. So the question is, what changed? Why did it go from being something that was positive to something that's uncertain or vulnerable? So let's just break down those issues. Supply chain disruptions is what we're talking about. And the supply chain is about the links. And the disruptions are about the shocks. So the question is, did the links change or did the shocks change? <clears throat> it wasn't the links. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides which shows that the world global supply chain has becoming less involved. There's been a defragmenting or deglobalization of global supply chains. So the chart on the left shows intermediate use as a production of total as a percent of total production in the whole world. So domestic, international, everything. So how much intermediates are used over gross production? And as you can see from 95 up to 2013, as I think most people would expect, that got more intense with offshoring, outsourcing, and including fragmentation within countries. But since 2013, it's been declining. That's not a blip. It's been going on now for 10 years. If you look at the right chart, this shows that world supply chains are localizing, not becoming more international. So the right chart shows imported intermediates as a percentage of all intermediates used worldwide for manufacturing. This is for manufacturing. And as you can see, from 95 up to 2014, it rose rapidly, again, with the outsourcing and offshoring and all that sort of stuff. But since then, it's been declining. And now it's back to where it was in the 1990s. So there is something changed about manufacturing. And it's not that the links are becoming more intense. So let me show this for Japan. So Japan's exposure to imported industrial intermediates. The chart shows the percent of Japan's industrial imports that were imported between 1995 and 2020. And what you can see is although the share went up, the blue line is for the whole world, the orange line is from China in particular. And you can see from 95 up to about 2015, it was rising steadily, but it has barely risen since then. It went down and coming back up a little bit. That, that up at the end, that, those are the COVID years, so we don't know if that's a blip or not. But there's no obvious increase in the intensity of the reliance on foreign Im imports. And here is Japan's import of indus industrial inputs as a share of all industrial imports. And here you can see that that's declined quite sharply from 2009. So we th how much of Japan's manufactured imports are intermediates? That's the question. And how much you, and it's gone down a lot. So several indications show it's not the links that got more intense that all of a sudden made foreign shocks more of a pro problem. So our argument, if it wasn't the links, it was the shocks. So we want to talk about that. Before, it was mostly idiosyncratic shocks. One nation, one sector, relatively transient. So it would have been an earthquake, a flood, or a particular strike. Today, many of the shocks are systemic in the sense they involve many sectors, nations, and they tend to be longer lasting. So the, the examples everybody knows about are COVID-19 being the granddaddy of them all, the US tariffs being put up higgly piggly different places, that's caused problems. Brexit was another one. General US-China conflict, and more recently the invasion of the Ukraine and the war in the Middle East. Now, before, firms can deal with idiosyncratic shocks, but governments get involved with systemic shocks. So in our take, what changed was the nature of the shocks, not the nature of the links. So we came up with a classification of shocks, <clears throat> six combinations. So the source of the shock is either supply side, demand shocks, or connectivity between supply and demand, such as ports and transportation. And then the top row is the idiosyncratic one, and we give a few examples there. I won't read through them. The systemic ones are on the bottom. Now, it's important to note that the shocks are not mutually exclusive and have, including very recently, with one shock, like a demand shock, leading to a supply shock, therefore. So there, it's not a perfect. But I think it's very important that in discussion we hear in the news feeds and in the headlines is frequently thinking it's supply problems. And that's it. That's what these shocks were from. 
and all the fixes have to be about diversifying supply, for example. And we wanted to point out that it's more complicated than that. There's three different types, and there's long and there's short. So now I want to turn, well, let me just say two more seconds about this. So one of the critiques of our early paper was that, well, this is over. COVID's over. U.S.-China, that's actually getting better. So we pointed out that we believe there's three sources of systemic shocks coming. The first one is uh, U.S.-China tensions spreading all other things, Russia, UK, Russia, EU, also EU, US, lots of geostrategic shocks are still coming. The second is climate change. So climate change will cause lots of things, but when it comes to trade, for example, the Panama Canal is at about half capacity because of a drought that's led to a reduction. And a number of times the Rhine water has gotten so long that it disrupted uh, transit. And now, for example, in the uh, Suez Canal is facing geopolitical attacks, which is disrupting supply. So the, 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 no, that, that, that was not a global warming story, but massive storms that knock ports offline could lead to many systemic. So for instance, if there was a massive uh, hurricane that hit Singapore, that would be incredibly disruptive, and m massive storms are going to be more likely. And finally, digital, in particular, cyber attacks. So as more and more is online, cyber attacks for the infrastructure, let's say airports, uh, sh shipping, pipelines, even attacking things like customs offices, uh, could disrupt things for many sectors many times. So we don't think the systemic shocks are over. We hope they are, but, but I, I don't think this is the end of it. Now let's talk about measurement issues. And I hope you appreciate how Chatty uh, produced this, you know, measurement issues, global. So there's like a globe there, there's it region, and then there's the old fashioned stuff with trucks. And so I, I, I really like that one. Okay. So <clears throat> what we wanted to do here, and remember this was given in Washington. So Washington is super concerned about supply chains. For example, especially semiconductor supply chains. And the, the national security uh, agencies and the Commerce Department have been trying to figure out what the supply chains are. And they've been taking this view on the left, what we call the business view, where it is a chain. This is all coming from Michael Porter, business professor, his value chain story. And it's focused on a single firm, which is buying and selling. So a firm buys, makes, and sells. And if you want to know what the supply chain is, then you go to who was the firm that bought the stuff they bought from, and then you go back one, it's called tier one, tier two, tier three, like that, and you go back. Uh, and that, that is a one way of going about it, and if you want to go very detailed, it's probably the only way of going about it, but we're going to argue that that is an incomplete view of the world. So on the right is the economics view, which points out that supply chains are not chains, they're networks whole bunch of firms selling to a whole bunch of firms. And in economics, we have input-output tables that shows all the sales of all the sectors in all the countries to each other. And therefore, you get a much more complete view of what your supply network looks like. And to, uh, to, to contrast between these, uh, there's no right one or wrong one. I think they're complementary. But an example would be like this business view is like your family tree, and you think of your your parents as the tier one suppliers and your grandparents as the tier two suppliers, et cetera. And even if you had really good family trees and a bunch of them, you could not get a perfect view of population dynamics because you're only looking up one family. And it may be very important things between that aren't captured. Whereas this is looking at the whole c connections together. So we're, our, our uh, whole rest of the paper and the whole rest of the discussion and our indicators are going to use the economics view which has its own problems. It's very aggregated, et cetera. Not all the countries are there, but it has uh, other merits to it. So why we developed new indicators. <clears throat> so in the 1990s and 2000s, the poly policymaker question was, where is the work actually done? And the telling example was iPhones, where people widely knew that although the iPhone seem to be coming from China, only about 10% of the value added, 10% of the jobs were in China. And so this led to a focus on value added trade. In other words, how much value added from one country is in the exports. 
and that led to indicators, things like backward linkages. So here's the indicators for backward and forward linkages for Japan. So backward linkage is Japan buying from GVCs in order to export. And the orange line, the forward linkages, this is Japan selling into foreign GVCs for them to export. So it's always about value added in gross exports. And you can see it went up in 2011 coming down, 2014, but it's still not very big. It's about 20% there. Those aren't very massive. Now in the 2020s, policymakers' question was, how vulnerable are my supply chains? Which is really saying, where is the production of my inputs actually done? To answer the new questions, we developed new indicators based on gross trade, not value-added trade. So for those of you who don't spend your entire lives studying trade, let me explain value-added trade and, and gross trade. So gross trade is just trade. If you look in the newspapers, what is the export this year for Japan, that's gross trade. Value-added trade is that when you strip out imported intermediates. So it's like when Japan's exporting stuff, some of the stuff Japan's exporting isn't Japanese. It may include German or, or French or uh, Chinese inputs. And value-added tr trade strips out those intermediates to actually figure out how much Japanese value-added is in those. So those are the two, two, two different things. Now, our, uh, we're very happy that the OECD has included our indicator in the 2023 uh, TIVA database up. So these things are all online for all the countries, all the sectors, if you want to look at them. <clears throat> and um, I want to give you an example of, of how you can go wrong using value-added trade to look at disruptions. So, and, and I heard this from a, a Bank of England guy when we launched the new TIVA database. So he said that they were doing simulations of what would be the inflationary impacts of the shocks from COVID in China. And they way underestimated the impact because they were working with backward linkages, value added. And the value added that was coming from China was much less than the gross flows. But the disruptions didn't just stop the Chinese value added, it stopped the whole flow. And therefore, the price impact was much larger than they thought. So that was a classic example where if you're looking at disruptions, you don't want to look at value added, you want it to look at the whole flow. Or I'll give you another example too in a second. So I'm going to talk about key distinctions of our indicators, because this that's what we're we're having a new way of measuring it. So the first one is as I mentioned before, gross trade, not value added trade. And the telling example is the Ambassador Bridge strike in 2022. So the Teamsters blocked this bridge, which essentially connects the Canadian auto industry to the American auto industry. They blocked it for six days, which shut down manufacturing in the United States. Because these guys were blocking not just Canadian value added, they were blocking the entire gross value added. And so if you were trying to figure out how impactful would this blockage be using value added, you grossly, no, no pun intended, grossly underestimated what actually happened. The second distinction is we distinguish between face value exposure to foreign production, which is direct purchases. So if you look at the thing, say from China to the United States, A, these are China inputs exported to the US directly. So that's what we call face value exposure. And you can just read it off the data, the standard data. But there's also look through exposure, which is China's inputs exported indirectly to the US via Mexico's intermediate exports. So China sells parts to Mexico, Mexico makes parts with those parts, and then exports to the United States. So that's what we call look-through. If you look through the veil of the whole supply chain, you realize that U.S. industry is more dependent upon China than looks like at face value. And that was perhaps the big takeaway of our paper, in, in the U.S. at least in particular, that's what they wrote about. Okay, number three key distinction is we count imported intermediates used in production for domestic consumption, not just exports. The backward linkages, the ones that are standard, only look at the content of exports. So the intermediate has to cross borders twice. But of course, when you're thinking about disruptions, you don't care whether it's exported or not. What you're looking at is the disruption of domestic production. So we take all imports of intermediate goods, not just the ones that end up in exports, and the same on the export supply. So I just um, parenthetically say here, uh, we do indicators on the import side, which every, we, we emphasize those in Washington, that's because that's what everybody's excited about in Washington. 
But in a world where there's going to be systematic embargoes and counter-retaliation, your dependence on foreign production as a demand may also become very important. And we have those measures, symmetric measures as well. <clears throat> OK. So now I want to do is uh, go through some US global supply chain engagement facts. The first one, or first type of hidden exposure, and you know, I, I don't know if you like this graphic. You know, I said put a veil on the world to hide it, but that's what it came up with. It's kind of cool. I couldn't resist. Very sort of Star Trek, uh, Dune kind of thing. I don't know. But uh, there it is. So I want to talk about the difference between look through, which is the full, and the face value, which is the, the one you can actually see in the data. So here's one way of, argue, of showing that. So this, th these two bars show US exposure to China is higher on a look-through than face value basis. And what these bars do is show the percentage of US of the 17 manufacturing sectors in our data where China is the top supplier. And this is for 2018, which is where the data stopped when we wrote the paper. So on a face value basis, China is still very, very important. Canada is important. Mexico is important. But on the look through, China is absolutely dominant. They're the top supplier in every sector except pharmaceuticals. And that blue is Switzerland in pharmaceuticals. Because, of course, Canada was importing Chinese parts. And Mexico was importing Chinese parts. And Canada was importing German parts that had Chinese parts in them. So when you add up the whole thing, you see that the US is much more exposed to China than the standard statistic would suggest. The second part of hidden exposure is the rapid geographic concentration of sourcing. Oh, that, by the way, was, was draft one of the veil on the world. I, you know, I didn't know if it worked, but I wanted to use it anyways. So the idea with this is that one of the reasons the exposure is hidden is because it's concentrated in China so rapidly that many people don't know this. So here, for example, if you do those two bars from 1995 and 2018, you see China was nowhere on uh, look through a face value. In fact, it was Japan who was the China back then. So if you see the face value in 1995, it looks very small. It was only a couple industries where Japan was the number one supplier. But of course, Japan was making inputs that Canada used that then exported to the United States. So if you looked at Japan's contribution on a look-through basis, it was over half. So that was the big distinction. And then you see how, bunch, how rapidly China grew. So that was a fantastic change. Now here is at the global level. <clears throat> this chart shows manufactured intermediate production, not trade, production, percentage of the whole world. And the point is that China's production of manufactured intermediates rose rapidly and is now dominant. So this, we have three lines here. China, the blue line is all developed countries put together. The G7, the EU, Australia, New Zealand, the, all of them in there, Japan included. And you can see China now makes more intermediate than all the developed countries put together. And that's been true since about uh, 2014. Not many people know that. And the, uh, the rest of the world, which will include you know, people like India and Korea and a few, Mexico coming up, but still, they're about to pass the, the, the developed countries. So not, not many people knew about that, and that's one of the reasons it was so hidden. OK. Now, uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about policy. And I think, actually, I think this looks like the Peterson Institute a little bit, if you've ever been there. But I don't know where they got the picture. But now we're going to talk about policy. For some reason, Chatty cannot spell. So I put in there, organizing framework, not empirical work. And you see in the graphic there, it's misspelled everything, turn the letters around. Not sure what's going on there, but probably next year it'll be better. Um, OK. So the question here, when is policy justified? Given that firms aren't like randomly doing their supply chains, firms are optimizing already. So what, this is what we call the risk wedge. So this wedge is going to come from risk perceptions, not externalities, which is the classic economic uh, way of going about it. So it's not externalities. So here, um, you know, now I work for a business school, so I, do, I don't have to label my, my axes. You know, so it's risk going up. I don't have to tell you what the measurement is. It's just risk, more risk. And then over here is reward. Well, I'll be clear, that's cost savings. So we're clear. And this, th so this, by the way, just to give away the story before I talk through it, <clears throat> 
This is portfolio analysis. This is like finance 101. So you have risk and reward. How diversified is your portfolio? <clears throat> and you know, you'd like to have the highest reward one, but then it's more risky. So there's a trade-off. And the blue line is the possibility frontier, the risk versus reward. So as you get more and more cost savings, you're concentrating more and more production in the lowest cost, but that's also increasing your risk at, at an increasing pace like that. So it's bowed up like that. And the private evaluation of risk versus reward is a dash blue line. So they like cost savings, they dislike risk. So it's curved like this, and they would, they would love to be uh, lower risk and higher savings. So point P is optimal diversification of supply chain risk for the private sector. Now, in many, many cases, that's probably where the society should be. There's no particular reason for the government to try and make a different choice. For one thing, business knows way more about the supply risks than the government could ever possibly, and it, things are expensive and mistakes and time lags and things. But it is possible that the public evaluation, which is the red line, is more worried about risk than the private sector. So their trade-off, they still want some cost savings, but they may come up with a different trade-off at point S. And that's the wedge. So if the public sector has a higher perception of risk than the private sector, you have a good reason why the government might want to intervene in the supply chain diversification and get involved in resilience and all those sorts of things. By the way, it was, was interesting when we wrote that when we started writing this paper, there was almost nothing in economics on supply chain disruptions or resilience. But there's huge academic societies, journals, departments with logistics, risk, supply chain risk management. So there's like a whole bunch of people who really have been taking this seriously forever. And when, once the economists, you know, we, we economists come to a topic and it's like, well, no, nobody's ever done anything before, right? So, <laughs> but they actually have, and that's why probably P is the go-to point. But governments have decided that they should start to intervene in many of these things, supply chains, uh, semiconductors, medical products, electric batteries. There's a number of them where they've decided they need to intervene. And what we want to do with this is we should be thinking hard as to which sectors we do this in. Now let me give you a couple of examples uh, of what creates this risk perception. And I'm going to do it with analogies from two sectors, farms and arms. I hope you like that. It rhymes. It used to be uh, agricultural and military equipment, but uh, what came to me one night, farms and arms, wow, that's it. Everybody will remember that. But the point is, in farms and arms, governments throughout history, all across the world, engage in very expensive, very persistent, very intrusive policies to diversify supply risk. Almost every country spends tons of money making sure that there's a certain amount of production of food at home, or at least in countries that they can rely on. And the same with military supplies. Almost every country who can afford it tries to have an arms industry in case something happens. Now there, it's very easy to see that the individual farmer, of course he cares about risk, but the individual farmer doesn't care about famine to the same extent that the government does. Famine can lead to social disruption and all sorts of really big problems that the individual farmers don't really take account of. And the same with military equipment. I mean, people would like to make it wherever it was cheapest or the technology was, but in times of war, you really want it at home. And, and we've recently seen examples of that. So the financial sector is another sector where very systematically the private perception of risk is not accepted by the public sector. So the public sector says, this is too risky and we have to do something about it. So now the question is, does semiconductors fit into this? Does medical supplies fit into this? Do electric batteries fit into this? Are these now all of a sudden flipped over? And at least, you know, when I, when I sit on panels in, in front of big audiences and never get held accountable for what I say, I say maybe semiconductors has flipped over because maybe semiconductors are so crucial in industry, all types of industry, and it's, it's creeped up way faster than anybody knew. We, we found out in COVID that you can't make cars without chips. And who knew that? So it's so central. So maybe this has flipped over into that. But it's probably worthwhile doing a little bit more thinking about what are the spillovers if you shut off this or you shut off that. And medical supplies is the same thing. Uh, you, you know, during COVID, there was some serious 
problems at the social level because the production wasn't local. So now, <clears throat> the second thing I want to do before I end, next thing I want to do before I end, is talk about mapping shocks into remedies. And what I want to do here, or we wanted to do here in the paper, is kind of raise the flag that the usual discussion you see in the media and in public policy is too narrow. The usual thing is in, to increase supply chain resilience, we either have to reshore it or friendshore it or diversify the supply. That's a, you, you often hear that's what's going on, that's what the IRA is about. People are spending lots of money putting up trade policies, trying to change the location of production. Now, if you're worried about geolocated supply shocks, that's a good idea. Because if you have geolocated supply shocks, like say China shuts down during COVID, but uh, Germany shuts down in COVID a little later, then geodiversifying your supply is a good idea. And holding greater stocks is also a good idea. And, and companies are doing both of those. But for example, to reshore, it's not absolutely sure at all that putting all the production in one country is actually making it more safe. So there was a recent example of a hurricane in Louisiana, which wiped out a US pharmaceutical production facility that did, if I remember correctly, ibuprofen. And it seriously disrupted the supply. Now, if they had been importing it, and have, if, they, if they did import it, that's diversifying the supply. So if you look at the next type of shock, a demand shock, so you get a different mapping. So if you remember COVID, what happened in COVID was people all of a sudden went home and they needed all sorts of electronic equipments, Wi-Fi uh, equipment, laptops, uh, you know, all sorts of gadgets, cameras, microphones. And so there was a huge surge in the production of uh, electronics, which sucked up the supply of semiconductors, which then shut down the auto industry because there wasn't enough semiconductors for them. So that was a demand shock in the electronics industry that led to a supply shock in the car industry. And that's a classic example that you can't find with the chain analysis. You wouldn't have found that. It would have been an analysis. And in particular, geodiversifying supply would not have helped. The problem was it was just this demand surge. The only thing that would have really helped was greater stock holding. And reshoring wouldn't have done anything either. It was a demand shock. So it's important to think carefully about what the shocks you're worried about when you go to say which policies should we promote and spend billions of dollars of taxpayers' money on. Okay, so I'm going to end there. Uh, takeaway, measuring foreign supply chain exposure requires careful thinking and selection of measures. There's no, there is, oh, this is, uh, there's a not missing there. There is not a single best indicator. Ours are one of many that can be done. And we need much more theoretical, empirical research on supply chain disruptions, not supply chains or global value chains, which is what we've been looking at for 20 years. So there's, I, I, I have no idea what ChatGTP was thinking about when it did that graphic. But I said, more research is needed. And it came up with that, a book and a world, I don't know, stars, I don't know, pieces of the puzzle flying around. But I, I couldn't resist it. So. Uh, so thank you for listening. This is a paper it was based on, and those are my co-authors, Rebecca and Angelos, and I thank them for all the work they did. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Baldwin, for very interesting, illuminating presentation on supply chain disruptions.